high level of responsibility to do that, yeah? So this is a proposal of how we make use of our gathering, our knowledge, to, to do something, yeah, practical. So we're proposing a framework to take this forward. Um, the current situation is like this. There is a huge need for Sudanese in exile, who knows something, who believes they know something, even those within the country, to do something. Uh, uh, people are scattered worldwide. We need to do something to bring them together. We, we are only few. We are only portion of diasporas in exile, yeah? Do you agree with me? There are a lot more who probably don't know about this, and it's still to be reached and invited, yeah? Um, the current situation, if you take Sudan as an example, is not very good, is not promising. Um, there is a desperate need for improving public services, health services, there is poverty, there are people who can't find clean water to drink. We all understand that, yeah? Yeah, but our country got resources. We are not exploiting them, we got vast, amount of water and fertile lands, we know that. We are not using it. We are not using it wisely. I'm going to talk today about a model that's set by Muhammad Shumu. <coughs> that we haven't, I mean, when we did it, we didn't have all this beautiful knowledge, and graphs and slides, but we had the good intention to do something good to our country. So, I'm going to, to move with the right one? Yes, I'll right one, yes. The, I'll just give you a historical background about the Sudanese uh, medical links to UK. That started in 1924 by the graduation of the first batch of doctors from the then uh, called uh, Kitchener Medical School. That was later amalgamated in 1952 to a Khartoum University College and 1956 by being amalgamated to Gordon Memorial College to become the uh, University of Khartoum. To move a step further, postgraduate studies until 19, mid-1970s, the doctor they used to come to UK here to specialize. Mid-1970s, there was the establishment of postgraduate uh, deanery in University of Khartoum, 
and they started most of the clinical specialties. Still, there were some few specialties that they come to UK and specialize, like my own specialty, which is histopathology, plus the other basic sciences. And another event that happened, which is important, there were two surges of immigration from Sudan to UK. They started late 1970s, and another surge in 1980s. Both are politically related. There were some immigration before that, which is economically related to the Gulf region. But to UK, mainly, it was based on Sudanese, inside Sudanese politics. This is one of our conferences. Mameda <laughs> is the Minister of Health in Khartoum State, Professor Sheikh Mahjoub. This is an international figure. And that me hiding there as well. I'm not smiling. So the analysis assessment of the Sudanese sustainable development goals, you can see it's it's not a bright picture. I'm gonna just pick a few. Although the the in, the gross national income has increased in the last few years, it's still the poverty is 46, more than 46 percent. Uh, if we pick the infant mortality here, yes, I'm, I'm just uh, yeah. <laughs> if we pick the infant mortality here, it's one of the highest in the world, and 15% um, uh, of the people age 25 or above have had the opportunity to secondary school. That's a shocking figure. Uh, but if we if we take if we go deeper in the country, we'll find a more gloomy picture, and that's why I was. Uh, that's what brought the attention of rural development because we always target the national institution. We always pick the pilot, our, our pilot study around Khartoum. You can see here if you go greener, that you're doing better. If you if you going black, you're doing bad. So I thought, what what's our role? I went to the UK because I'm here, but uh, uh, obviously networking. But I think we need to move networking a little bit. We all, from from. Uh, there is also debate in the literature about profession and discipline. I think discipline people, uh, what, do we, what do we mean by discipline is not just professionals, not just uh, doctors, the people who support us, healthcare assistants, for example, in medicine. These people we could involve. The people who don't have, I think they don't have uh, the confidence to contribute. As, as an elite, we, we, we have the confidence to contribute. But the people down, the, the millions and millions live out, uh, abroad, especially in the Gulf, they do, I think most of them, they don't think um, they could contribute. And that's, uh, we should move from proficient to, to discipline. I think from few hundreds, how we can move the millions and in, in Enjoy uh, like include the juniors, the junior power. So, but uh, well, I think. Um, uh, uh, so the, so what we did, we went straight away to the local areas. We didn't go national. We went to the state. We spoke to the Northern Kordofan uh, state, and uh, we said we want to execute a project about. Uh, and it, it, it was used to call the village concept project. We changed it to so integrated human development project. And basically include poverty, human, uh, 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 water, clean water, uh, food. Uh, there is education, and there is basic health. So that's 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 the main thing. Uh, and we also have to uh, we support the innovative uh, projects, innovative business projects. And we we spoke to, to the government, and after a, f uh, a few discussion, they've said, "Oh, that's a, that's a good idea." So they've took it out, they've took it over, and they now uh, agreed uh, the Northern Kordofan Comprehensive Program for Rural Development. They name it like that. Obviously, it's too, uh, it's, it's too, it's too technical to me. But yeah, so and um, and they funded by two million dollar, and they're gonna start it this year. So that's I think I think that, and also you can see the in in the, the like the joy of. Of juniors from Sudanese juniors who would like to contribute to their countries, so they've said we'll, we'll take the whole bulk of the program, we'll, we'll implement it through the government, and we take the the supportive and uh, and feedback sections, and that's uh, that was a huge success. Although we didn't, we started last year in Turkey when we had our first meeting, but. Uh, that was a, the, I think that was a big step. So we thought, what's what's the next step? What other projects that we could do to, to to help that? 
And we, we thought, one, not to, to concentrate in social entrep entrep uh, entrepreneur. Uh, obviously, that term is being used heavily in literature, uh, overused sometimes, like one of the Harvard uh, University scholars said. But we have many projects about 12, but I'm going to speak about one of them, which is, yes, uh, I'm going to speak about one of them, which is the Arabic gum harvesting machine. This guy is one of our, you know, our team, his name is Mez Merghani, I think, uh, I don't know if some people know him. He's a guy graduated from University of Khartoum. That's his graduation project. It's a new harvesting machine to the Arabic gum. It will increase the efficiency of taking, uh, of, uh, of getting um, uh, Arabic gum by three folds. Sudanese income from uh, uh, Arabic is about three, 300 million. It will go above one billion. This student was outstanding student. He was a graduate of Sudanese, uh, Su Sudan University of Science and Technology. He was refused admission at the University of Nottingham, uh, of Reading, and then he joined the University of Nottingham. And his score was the highest score for all our batches the highest score at the level of all master's universities at Nottingham. He got two prizes for the best score for his speciality and all master uh, students at that year. His score was 97, uh, 79, sorry. So it shows that uh, we have the talent, we have the elite students for that. What are the current situation of higher education now? This is a quick look. We have over 100 universities and colleges. 67,200 undergraduate in 2011. This is because we don't have any published uh, statistics from the Ministry of Higher Education after that. 25% graduates are first and second class, around 16,880. This is for the whole uh, universities. This results are calculated by us. We collected data from University of Sudan, University of Khartoum, and we found that both universities, because they are the biggest uh, University in terms of number of students and the top two universities. Uh, well, there's no statistics showing otherwise. 25 uh, percent. Uh, they say that 70 to six, 7 to 6 percent are first class, and a 17 to 15 percent are second upper. So this student, this number shows that we have some kind of potential in that number from the elite graduate. No program for sponsoring them. If you go to any international, any public na national civil society group, nobody is interested to send people there. And uh, the Ministry of Higher Education, they have a list of the main topics of research, but it's all, all funded internally. Nobody is being sent. Students are advised to get the scholarship, and then maybe the ministry may help them in the living expenses. So that was uh, one of the big obstacles for anyone to pursue. Most graduates now work abroad, creating great loss of human resources. Now, many of the presentations here reflect that remittances are most uh, benefited uh, the communities there, but in our opinion as a center, we believe that the human resources are the most valid than remittances because they create, countries are built by human resources, not by money. This, this presentation is about a proposal to study a certain phenomena. The idea came from, uh, um, I was an, ev an, an event, uh, and then a lady approached me, she knows me, and she said, we have a, a weight loss uh, WhatsApp group. And we are uh, people who know each other, relatives, friends, and we are overweight, we decided to lose weight. And we created this group. And uh, the group was running on for like uh, three, four months. And she asked me if I can join the group to observe the information that they are exchanging with each other. Now, I said yes, and then I told her, just give me time to observe, like one month before I decide to, uh, 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 to, join. to join and uh, to observe what you are saying and to give an advice. And then I thought about, I started to uh, search in the literature. I didn't find any uh, uh, support groups created by the public that didn't include any professionals, and there was published data about it. Uh, most of the Facebook groups or um, uh, other types of chatting rooms are, uh, especially for people with chronic diseases and health problems, are supervised or created by health professionals. So I decided to do a study. 
and uh, I, I designed this proposal um, to uh, explore a cross-platform mobile messaging application, which is the WhatsApp, and it is used by a self-created weight loss group. And as I said, the usage of the cross-platform mobile messaging applications is popular in exchanging information, including health and weight-related mes messages. And um, uh, because I live in Saudi Arabia, uh, most of the members of the group, uh, they live in Saudi Arabia, but some of them are outside. And um, so they are diasporic, uh, but still they exchange the information and, and uh, their feelings also in that uh, uh, group. And as been highlighted yesterday, the Sudanese economy in a state of crisis, and uh, also the industrial sector is not uh, effective, is not delivering. If we compare it to the G7 average um, countries in Sudan, uh, the contribution for, from individual to industrial to, to the economy is ninety dollar per year compared to $5,290 in every G7 country. So it's very weak. Um, yeah, it's, and, um, and if we notice all the developing countries managed to get out from the poverty through industrialization uh, path, and Sudan would not be an exception. Manufacturing it always is adding value to the economy. Um, so in this paper, we will um, uh, identify and examine what's, what's the enablers to the manufacturing, to the industrialization, and the inhibitors. So for, for the case of Sudan, we, we've looked into the Ministry of Industry. What is the performance, what is what the Ministry of the Industry is doing in terms of the, uh, the industrial strategy or industrial policy. We went through it, and uh, actually it was set for the manufacturing sector for 2007, 2030. But when you look on it, uh, it reflects back the key um, um, the, the key, the key important uh, uh, information you need for industrial strategy, it was it wasn't very clear, and, and and it wasn't clear how much consultation has been used to um, to develop this strategy. There is there is no cross referencing back inside the, the strategy itself. Uh, it has uh, identified uh, sectors, uh, industrial sectors. For 25 years, but when you look inside it, it, it sets objectives only for five years. And by the way, this information is captured from the Minister of Industrial website. For my presentation today, I've put in that big title reporting from the front, but actually, this is not the main title for my topic, and I'm going to <coughs> tell a small story about it maybe later on for the presentation. But uh, the main uh, point that I'm going to speak about for today is climate change, conflict, and displacement disaster risk reduction in Sudan. Now, thinking about these, uh, I would say, three main keywords, climate change, the impact of climate change on urban livelihood and natural biodiversity systems have been really observed worldwide. A huge uh, amount of, I would say, a huge number of people have been dying each and every day, and these numbers are just increasing. But speaking about assets, economic, uh, like financial assets and human lives that have been taken, but in all, Due to the lack of the management, it's not that we do not have strategies, we do not have policies, but are, actually, do we actually, are we actually implementing it in the appropriate way? Putting into that context of climate change, it automatically generates disasters, but when I speak about disasters, there are two elements that we need to understand. The first point are the hazards that are causing the disasters. And the, number, the second element is actually the vulnerability to those disasters, because that's what makes the disaster worse. So if we manage to reduce the level of vulnerability, automatically, I would say, we reach into better standards of resilience to disasters. So if flooding would cause, uh, I would say, uh, in Sudan, for example, in 2013 only, the amount of people who lost their lives because of flooding was 3 million. 
So that number could be reduced if we just, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. I'll come into the figures in a second. So these figures could be reduced if we improved the level of resilience. Before coming into, into the details of that presentation, the first question that comes into our mind is who are we speaking about? Who are the population that we are targeting? And who are the beneficiaries of this research? It's the displaced community. But what does the word displaced mean? And I'm putting the context into context in red color place because I'm going to focus on to the urban context of displacement, not only the social perspective that's always taken by humanitarian aid agencies. So the word displaced take us into a definition of, uh, sometimes we call them internally displaced populations, so that's IDPs, and sometimes it goes into DPs only, so displaced people. In both contexts, are they refugees, are they internally displaced? The only difference that we have that that if they are crossing international borders, they are refugees. If they are within the country, they are internally displaced. But in all cases, they are forced, obliged to leave places of habitat residence. So places they live, they grow in, they have been going to schools, working. So it's in turn an entire life that have been taken away from them forced to leave these places, whether through armed conflicts, that's why it's conflict, or whether the human and man-made disaster, that's why it's climate change. As we all know, there's a great need for diaspora contribution. The diaspora in some countries is substantial, uh, as in the Gulf countries, where we have a proxy of uh, over 10,000 doctors, the UK and Ireland, and uh, most of you live here and are quite aware of the huge numbers and the numbers that are increasing day by day, and the USA of over 500. These are just proxies of some of the countries where our diaspora is scattered and special focus on medical and health professions. Um, speaking about diaspora and speaking about migration, uh, making the use and benefit and uh, making use of the brain drain to brain gain. So how can we gain from all the, these intellects, our professionals, you expatriates back in our home country, Sudan? And the te technology transfer, transferring technology, and the expertise, the skills, the knowledge that you all hold back to Sudan. Willingness of the diaspora to contribute to the source country, and that's the heart and soul of the project itself. It's without expatriates as yourselves and others, and their willingness to contribute and to give back to our country, Sudan, in their respective field, that it's possible. And the potential for facilitating useful links through the individuals themselves, through the institutes they represent, and through their links within the countries that they work in. As we all know, there are great challenges for speciality training in Sudan. And the number one is migration itself. So the migrating health professions, medical doctors, consultants, registrars, and so forth, they do not only provide health services within the hospitals, but we also know that they're the ones themselves that lecture the students that produce uh, the coming generation. So there's numerical shortage of trainers there, and certain gaps in specialities and subspecialities that were rare to start with, and the numbers were few, but now diminished or demolished at all. The need to boost quality and different perspectives and the need uh, for that sort of exchange of experience and expertise and knowledge that every person brings back home and the need to scale up the CPD system and practice along with its institutional capacity needs of the Sudan Medical Specialization Board itself in respect to its 33 councils. Thank you.